Uh, just while our um, support team are trying to get Andrew Drysdale back, Chris Norman is waiting in the wings, and I'm happy for for people to start putting in their questions in the live Q and A. Hi, Chris is on the screen with me now. Um, Chris, good to see you. Bye, bye, Chris. Bye. There is one question from Bev B, and I'm not sure if it was meant for you or for Andrew, but I'll, I'll put it to you and see if you can answer it. Um, there are, oh, sorry, this is from Don, and Don is getting very confusing because he comes up as Bev B and then he always signs off as Don. But there are good examples of robust partnerships between NRM organisations and the private sector. Actually, that seems like more of a comment, but that was your section about um, robust uh, partnerships. What's your so favourite example? I think his question is, are they good? Robust partnerships. Uh, so, yes. okay. so it is a great question, Don, um, and it's probably something that shows how our sector is moving. Um, so traditionally, yeah, we we operated, I guess, totally within the public sector, uh, public organisations. I guess the non for profits in Queensland probably have been a bit broader minded than that. But we've actually just started to sign some deals with uh, the private sector, and in fact, government is actually encouraging us to work with the private sector. Obviously, there's, there can be seen as a bit of a conflict there between us, which has got to focus on the public good and using public funds to get a public good versus potentially a private sector that's a profit organisation trying to drive profit. But uh, I think once that's transparent, you can certainly work hand in hand. And we're looking very much forward to working with um, one of the, a private organisation here to deliver some services uh, to nature refuge land managers across Queensland over the next couple of years. So. I think with the opening of environmental markets is another area, Don, where I think we're going to have to work hand in hand with um, the private sector. But again, let's be really transparent about what our role is and what their roles are and where that overlap and partnership um, opportunities are. It's a really good question, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Great answer. Now, Chris is with us for a short time longer, uh, but Andrew is waiting in the wings and we're going to bring Andrew in as well. We've got a question for Andrew. Um, hi, Andrew. Good to see you. Sorry about our power bump throwing you out. The question for you comes from John in Brisbane. Uh, he says, Andrew, in 1880, with 55% of the population being rural, voting apparently was not sufficient to lighten the kit bag of woes. If all we can vote on are different forms of business as usual, aren't we going to do it tough? Share some ideas past the vote. In question. I don't know whether I've got the whole gist of that question. Um, I, I guess to... he, he's, he's, wanting to, he's wanting to know if the, you know, if, um, if we're such a, a small voice in parliament, you know, how do we how do we deal with what's in front of us? How do we yeah. uh, influence if we can't influence through voting? I think is what uh, John was wanting to know. I think Andrew may have frozen there. So either that or he's thinking very deeply about your question, John. I'm going to go now to Kate Forrest. Um, so did you want me to have a go at the Nicole? I'm not, I won't answer yeah. as well as Andrew, but I'm used to filling in Andrew's role and backing him up. Um, so it's a great question from John Brisbane, and it's it's obviously a challenge for any remote areas in Australia, isn't it? It's in, in the political arena, how do you influence that? And I guess, you know, I guess in your area you've got, you know, a very strong member in David Littleproud out there, um, and I guess it's influencing those members to then have the louder voice and, and to pick up the more important portfolios within government and be as part of that, that process. But, um, yeah, it's it's always a massive challenge where the votes are so small. Um, but it's, you know, a conference like this really helps because what we're trying to do is get the story out to the broader community to understand what the value of the rangelands is and what the value of the rangelands is to them, even if they're living on the eastern seaboard. So in my back, uh, can you hear me now? I'm going to put Andrew back in. Thanks, yeah, Andrew. Um, I, hope you don't, I hope you don't contradict my answer now, Andrew. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> Andrew, Chris was simple. trying to answer for you. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we need a gerrymander. <laughs> but I, but um, we really need a, um, we need to marshal the people. And I'm, as I said, I'm not sure what part of whether you heard the last bit about the Outback Alliance. I don't know what whether it came on after the blackout, but... Uh, it is through alliances that we need to to try and lift our our power of influence um, and strong alliances that tug at the hearts of of people. The RFDS is is one example. Um, 
it's through alliances with the Isolated Children's Program. They target the hearts of, of people. Uh, and it is a little bit about through embarrassing governments. When did the Aboriginal go for very small population or percentage of population? It wasn't until, sadly, sadly, we saw photos and, and footage of Aboriginal kids walking around sniffing tins of petrol that we finally got governments to move and say, this is simply not good enough. Uh, and that's the sad, sad, sad reality. And I, I hope we don't need to get there. It's an absolute embarrassment if we do, but it's a bit of all of those, I think. Fantastic. I'm really glad you could rejoin us for that. Um, there is a comment in the question section from Kate Forrest. Just uh, she's giving some additional information. Uh, if people are interested in that, they can see that um, link there. Um, just as we wait for more questions to come in, um, Chris and Andrew, Andrew, we did lose just the tail end of your presentation. Was there any key point that you just wanted to uh, reiterate um, to the audience that's able to join us at the moment? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure. Did did you um, get? We got it. We got as far as the Outback Alliance. Okay, so you heard about the Outback Alliance. Uh, now, I suppose that the key message that I wanted to leave in my last slide was, despite the kit bag of woes and that, the, the Canberra University, Jackie Shermer um, Wellbeing Survey in 2020, we, as a part of the Lake Air Basin Community Advisory Committee, commissioned her to focus on the Lake Air Basin. And uh, the wellbeing of the Lake Air Basin community is higher on average than, the, than um, urban Australians. So, you know, despite the, that kit bag and the, and, the, and the bit of doom and gloom that I'm usually a glass half full person, uh, people love living in the outback and, and remote Australia and they do live well. Sadly, the chances of surviving a heart attack still no better. Actually, it's worse, but they put all that aside. So, you know, maybe we do a lousy job of also promoting um, the, the lifestyle and the outback because we need people out there to manage, um, to continue to grow our economy. We need people out there to manage the natural resources and the challenges that are faced there in terms of base of pests, wildfire and the like. But um, yeah, it's not all bad. Yes, Andrew, and I know that and, and I'm not um, the expert to, to provide information, but certainly if we got that cartoon driven from a, a, a drawn from a city person's perspective, uh, they might be even deeper in the waters of debt with um, with their issues, um, and that would explain the well-being. I would say um, I also wear another hat when I'm not emceeing conferences, and I work for the Remote Area Planning and Development Board, and we've just launched a campaign called Go Far Out. Out.com.au, and I would encourage anyone to have a look. Uh, it's been designed specifically to address those woes uh, resting on city people's shoulders and to promote a lifestyle and opportunity and the answers to some of their um, challenges in modern life uh, can be found out here in the outback. So it's just one example of one corner of Australia uh, that's doing that. And uh, the story is the same right across uh, all of Australia's inland areas, those opportunities um, for a better life. So that's gofarout.com.au if you want to have a look at that. Uh, Chris, do you have any reflections uh, based on the way the conversation's going? Um. No, not particularly to that. I'm glad you added your little bit in. No, the thing that I was reflecting on, I guess, a little bit, Nicole, there is also the role of the Rural Financial Councils in this conversation. Um, I previously worked a lot in Victoria with the Rural Financial Councils and they're a fantastic network in supporting communities. I used to challenge them a lot uh, about their, their job was to get themselves out of a job by actually making people resilient financially. Um, easier said than done, but the Rural Financial Counselling Network are obviously critical to support uh, rural regions, the way Andrew described some of the challenges they have. I think debt was pretty high up in that uh, cartoon, Andrew, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, another statistic uh, I found, always found interesting in uh, when the last federal election, I think it was the one before, the Australian a ACF, Australian Conservation Foundation, ran a survey mainly in, in inner Melbourne 
and ask the question of, would you be happy for a portion of your tax to go to farmers and graziers to produce products more sustainably? And 80% said yes. So whilst we again think that there's this disconnect, and there is a large disconnect between people in the bush and in the city, there is also a desire, I think, that reside in city people that, that, that they want people in the bush to, to have a good quality of life, but also that they should be paid, and kept touching on Mike Berwick's um, presentation yesterday, they should be paid to produce the food that they want to eat in, in, in you know, clean, green, sustainable. So, um, yeah, yeah, with Australia being probably one of the most urbanised countries in the world, interestingly enough, um, we, the challenge, which I, I, I think we, we're going to have to meet on, come back to John Brisbane's question, is, is to find ways how do we engage with, that, with those city masses. And that's a, a perpetual question. Now, there's a question has come in from Kate Forrest. I'll ask this one and then I'll have to duck out and go to the other stream. Um, so I'll leave you gentlemen to wrap up. If the investment in NRM and other sectors was guided by the regional plans, would this lead to more appropriate local outcomes? And do the regional plans still allow for inter-regional collaboration? I'll leave that one with you gentlemen. And when you've wrapped up, it's morning tea time. All right. I'll have a go first and then Andrew can uh, reinforce or follow up, I guess. Um, so good question, Kate. And, and obviously the, the very purpose of regional plans is they start our regional plan. So they are driven and describe what the local community needs. Um, often you have this conversation about what they want and what they need. But the idea, I guess, of saying need is that they are aligned with where government directions are. Um, so the fact that there's a disconnect now between the funding process and the regional plans, as Andrew articulated, is a real problem because we're not getting the local outcomes um, as prioritised as much as they should be through the local planning process. So you're going through a local planning process, defining those regional priorities defined by the communities in conjunction with aligning with government stuff, but then the funding goes through a different process. So that disconnect is, is certainly impacting on whether we're getting those local outcomes, no doubt about it, no doubt about it. Um, the the inter-regional one is a really good question too. It's a little bit about some of the principles of the partnership stuff I was talking about before because they put the regional body processes into competition. We're competing for one bucket of money and then they're asking us to work together. Um, there's a whole lot of probity rules that are now in place that we never used to have that we can't talk to each other. So in one context, they're saying we want landscape, broader landscape outcomes, we want regions to work together, but then there's a lot of barriers put in place that make that very difficult. Um, there is some alliances that are clearly working well around that. NQNRM Alliance in Northern Australia brought three regional bodies together to deliver their regional land care partnership stuff. So that's great and that's that's a really good example and we should learn from that. But there's lots of examples where they're saying they want us to work together but in reality put us up in competition with each other. Um, Andrew, you want to add to any of that? I think uh, the regional plans, uh, the the... the the, the crux of the regional plans, it's about, and they're enablers, really, they are enablers. And uh, it's uh, often said that natural resource management is really people management, getting people engaged, people take ownership. Um, if there is issue or a problem, then you usually involve those who are part of the problem, part of the solution in designing and implementing the solution. And that's what the regional plans were largely about. What are the one of the conundrums I think that we should, um, and I think that our, our, our funders, our program managers in, in Canberra and Brisbane and around the capital cities face is that they, are, that they are audited based on basically outputs. Uh, the the uh, National Audit Office comes through and um, if you're trying to demonstrate capacity and lift of capacity and how that's being measured, it's pretty hard, it's damn hard, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it. So they're designing programs that um, that the Australian National Audit Office can, can go through and tick the box and the like, when we need programs that are about building people's capacity, really hard. But the NRM plans are a big part of that. Thanks, Andrew. I just noticed, uh... 
think this is Don again, under the under the disguise of Bev has written a comment here. Um, and I think it's a really good one about there's a there's just an important need for urban people to understand. Um, oh, sorry, for for remote people to understand urban people um, than the other way around. So you're exactly right, and I guess one of the the good things about regional NRM plans, Don, is that they are done across the whole landscape. So in Queensland, healthy land and water are responsible for a regional NRM plan that covers, you know, the, the greatest, fastest growing area in Australia, but basically the southeast corner of Queensland. Um, so th those regional issues, those issues identified in the, in the Brisbane and Gold Coast issues um, also need to be brought to the fore and need to be shared, as you say, with remote um, people as well, so that we do have a full comprehension of what we're all facing. We're all living in the one big landscape called Australia. It's important that we understand each other's context. Any comment on that, Andrew? Uh, Chris, are you wearing footy shorts today? Uh, you're not supposed to ask that question. I've actually got <laughs> fading, I've actually got fading of shorts on today, not just footy shorts. Uh, it's a world that we live in. I come from Victoria, Andrew, where you wear where you wear footy shorts for about two days a year, so it is a novelty to wear it for 320 days a year. Uh, uh, that's cruel. Uh, all right, I'm not sure we've got any other questions, though. I think we've uh, run out of questions. And Nicole, Max? You have done a stellar job, Chris. Thank you very much. And uh, you're not supposed to uh, get rid of the mystique of just the waste up broadcast, you know. It's an old uh, trade trick there. I'm not going to show what I have on my feet. Um, so thank you so much uh, for taking part in the session. Great to see you, um, Andrew. You're in person in Longreach. So, um, Please uh, duck your head in and say hello, catch up with um, with Andrew if you're also in Longreach. But don't forget, we do have those meeting rooms, those virtual meeting rooms. So just because you're not in Longreach doesn't mean you can't connect uh, with these two chaps. So try and reach out to them and arrange a meeting in the meeting room. Thanks again so much, uh, Chris and Andrew, for uh, a stellar job in uh, keeping the wheels in motion uh, through our technical difficulties and providing a great discussion. Uh, we're breaking for morning tea now. And and we'll be back uh, just in a few minutes' time. Thanks, Nicole. Cheers. Thanks, Andrew.